Hello everyone, Parallel here, and welcome to Star Trek Online. And a very big welcome to all of the new console players out there. This game was just released on the Xbox One and PlayStation platforms just earlier this week, and it is absolutely fantastic to see a lot of new players joining the game. In fact, that's what this video is about. I did watch some of the Let's Plays that are out there of the new console players coming into the game. It's always very interesting to watch new players to the game who have absolutely no knowledge of the game itself. But I did see that some of the players were struggling in the early levels to try to understand all of the mechanics of the game. So what I thought I would do is create this video and put together just some common tips to help new players. These will be very basic tips, things that uh, you know maybe were not explained very well in the tutorial, things that I noticed in people's Let's Plays where they were kind of uh, fumbling along and it was hard to understand because uh, the, this game is actually a very complex game, you know, but it also might be that the console user interface is not always the most clear and the tutorial itself is pretty uh, lackluster when it comes to explaining all of the complexities in this game. So that's what this video is about. Let's start with some common tips just to help out new players, particularly on the consoles and uh, help them along to learn some of the basic systems and get a hold of the game, you know, to get more comfortable in their initial leveling experience. This is not really some kind of comprehensive guide. Like I said, this is more based on some of the Let's Plays that I've been watching that I was noticing some common issues that players were experiencing. And I'm hoping actually Cryptic watches some of these uh, Let's Plays as well because uh, it shows some very significant, uh, you know, uh, deficiencies in their uh, tutorial and how it's not explaining things very well to the console players. Now you probably will notice as I bring up the user interface here that I'm actually on the PC version. Um, I don't have my Xbox One or PlayStation set up to be able to actually capture from those. So I will be trying to explain things here from the PC version. Uh, so, but uh, hopefully that will translate okay into the console because the user interface is actually quite different. But I will at least try to explain the systems so you can, uh, uh, you know, apply that to the console itself. All right. So first thing, let's start off with a few tips on the ground. Now here's one easy thing that uh, um, was made quite difficult by the console UI itself. And that is, I noticed a lot of players having trouble equipping their weapon. Um, now, as I bring up my character sheet here, I know you have to go into the menu in the consoles to see your actual character sheet, but you will actually notice that there are two weapon slots. And when I was watching uh, the Let's Plays, I noticed that people were equipping a weapon in only one slot, and they ended up not switching to the weapon, and they were stuck using their fists and punching things all the way through the initial part of the game. Um, so basically, if you only have one weapon here, so if you have one weapon and one blank slot, you can actually switch between the two, and what would happen is people would be actually switched to their fists, which I can't really do it here on Earth Space Dock, but you can see here when you have your uh, fist as your active weapon, you know, all you can do here is uh, punch. You can't really do anything else. So. On the consoles, you actually, you know, after you equip your weapon, you do actually have to switch to it. Um, there is a key to do it. I believe on the Xbox One, I think it was the Y button to actually switch weapons. I don't recall offhand, but uh, there is actually a way to switch between your weapons, right? So that's one thing that, uh, just one real quick thing that I noticed in a lot of Let's Plays. You do have to equip the weapon, and if you're sitting there punching, you do actually have to switch to that weapon. Now later, once you get two weapons, you can actually slot them both, like I have them here, and you can switch between them. So you can switch between your, your alternate weapon and your primary weapon. And that's something you can actually take advantage of later on because you actually get the stat or the uh, set bonuses from both weapons. Even if it's not your active weapon, you will still get the uh, stat bonuses from it. So. That's just something to keep in mind later on. You do want to have a weapon in each slot. Kind of think of it as like Warframe or Mass Effect where you can have kind of two weapons equipped, a primary and a secondary, and you can switch between them 
But if you don't have a weapon equipped in the second slot, then all you do is punch. All right, so that was just a real quick one. I noticed uh, some people struggling with, but uh, keep that in mind. You will have to go into you know into your uh, menu screen and go into your inventory you know to equip those weapons, and then you'll have to switch to it. All right. Now another thing I also noticed is that. Um, and this is actually very common. It seems that uh, it's not very clear and it's not well explained in the tutorial that once you have your you know, bridge officers that join you, you, you can change the abilities that they have. Now, um, as you're going through the tutorial and through some of the following missions, you will have bridge officers that come and join you. And they come with a set of skills. Now, it seems to be that people don't realize that you can actually change the skills that those characters are using. You can change them both for the ground and for or for ground abilities and for space. Um, in fact, let me go show you something here. You can actually, not only can you change the abilities they have, you can actually acquire new abilities. Let's go ahead and holster my weapon here. You can actually purchase new abilities and teach them to your officers. Oh, I'm lagging. Got some rubber band, go rubber banding going on here. Um, but uh, as you can see, I'm here in Earth Space Talk, and what you want to do is you want to come back uh, over here to the area where you know Admiral uh, Quinn is over there. You want to come down these stairs, and there's a little guy down here, the vendor. This guy right here, the bridge officer trainer. I don't know if a tutorial, I don't recall offhand if they ever have you come talk to this guy, but this is kind of an important guy. You want to come here and go to his store and you can actually see there are a lot of bridge officer skills you can learn. So there's for tactical and, and uh, space, tactical ground, engineering space, engineering ground, and so on, science. And later on you will get other abilities for your specializations. But uh, don't need to worry about those now, but uh, you do want to you know, come here to learn new abilities for your character, for your bridge officers, for your tactical, engineering, and science bridge officers. So when you first, you have your first ship here, and you go to your bridge officer stations, you can see they will have, you know, they'll come with some default ability that is equipped here. And this is where you can go to actually change the ability. Now the user interface again is different on the console, but I, I don't know if people are even aware of this. So um, if you are unaware, you can go in here and you can actually change the ability. You just have to learn it first. You have to teach that officer that ability first, and then you will be able to use it. And to teach them, all you have to do is come, like I said, to this vendor. You come select what you want. So let's say you have a tactical character and you want to teach them beam fire at will one. You can come here, you can buy it for a nominal credit cost. These credit costs are very low. Even new players should be able to afford these quite easily. You just buy this, it goes into your inventory, and then you go to your bridge officer, you go to their skills. Again, sorry, the user interface is gonna be a little bit different, but the same general uh, you know, idea applies. You go to their skills, and it, you can uh, then you can select the skill and teach it to them. It'll be, they see this little learn button here that will be highlighted if your character doesn't know that skill. So you just click the learn button, it will consume that uh, skill that you bought. It will consume it and you'll be taught your character. And then once you put that character into a slot on your ship, you will then be able to learn, uh, you know, select that skill. In fact, I highly recommend to new players, if you are not aware of what skills are quote unquote good and which ones are bad, um, I do suggest that you experiment, but there are some skills that are considered universally good. Uh, beam fire at will is one of them. In fact, I'll show that in action a little bit later, but this is very good for energy weapons. There are other ones like torpedo spread, which are very good for torpedoes. Um, these are all tactical officer abilities for engineering abilities. There are some very good ones like emergency power to weapons, which you can get again very early, even on the ensign level. And you can, um, that gives you a flat out uh, boost to your energy uh, power of your weapons and to your um, damage overall, just flat out 10% damage, as you can see right there. And on your science characters, a good one, uh, good one for these are like science team is good for a shield heal, hazard emitters is a good hull heal, 
Um, there are actually quite a few good science type abilities. Usually your science type abilities are for um, for healing or for, uh, well, there's actually quite a wide range of abilities for science, but there are good uh, abilities for hull healing and shield healing in science. Um, as well as engineering, engineering team is another good one for your engineering officer for a uh, nice big hull heal. You know, these are some of the ones you can get right off the bat that are very good. All right, so that's that's one thing there. And so you can also get, uh, do that for the ground as well. Um, when you're in your character sheet again in the in the menus, um, when you go to your character, or sorry, when you go to your stations, you can see down here, this is your away team. And just like you can change your uh, uh, abilities your bridge officers are using in space, you can also change them down here. This is what they will use when they're on the ground. It's kind of two separate pools of abilities, so your space abilities and your ground abilities. You can have the officer assigned to both places. You can have one be a bridge officer and also um, be on your away team. You just you just have to uh, pull, choose from their uh, ground abilities. All right. All right, so that's one thing just to keep in mind. Make sure you can customize your bridge officers. You can teach them those new skills. And it's something very important to do because sometimes the default skills that they come with aren't that great. Like maybe they come with a cannon ability and you don't even have cannons on your ship, right? So you'll want to come over to that a vendor and uh, teach them either a torpedo or a beam ability if that's the way you're going. All right, one other thing to keep in mind as well, and there is actually a tutorial about this, but that is uh, your abilities that you have on the ground as a, your uh, you as the captain. So you have all these abilities you can train to your bridge officers, but you can also learn abilities yourself. And this is through the kit system. On your character sheet, when you bring it up, you will actually see there is a slot here for kits. Now, like I said, through the tutorials, I believe they do give you a starter kit as well as some kit modules. The modules are what go inside of the kit. And those modules are what come down here into your ability bar and give you your new powers. Again, you the, the, the game doesn't do a really good job of describing that you can actually choose from a multitude of different kit abilities based on your career. So if you're tactical, there's a bunch of different tactical kit modules you can choose from. Engineering, there's a bunch of different kit modules. And then science, of course, there are a, a bunch of different ones you can choose from there as well. And I came over here to this character, again, on Earth Space Talk, because this is a vendor where you can go to requisition kits. So you select this uh, character, you requisition kits, and you can go here and you can see you can buy the kit itself and then the kit modules to put in it to get your actual abilities. And like I said, again, you can choose, you know, there's a lot of ones, different ones you can choose from. You don't have to be stuck with the ones that they give you, uh, you, know, the, you know, through the tutorial. You can actually come here and buy them. Now, you probably are noticing something here that each of the each of these have something here called a mark level. Um, again, this is something that's not very well explained, but basically, mark level is uh, kind of the kind of determines what is the appropriate uh, character level that should be using them, and also it's based on your rank. So maybe there's a, a better way to describe this. Let me head over to the shipyard, but Basically in this game, not to go too in depth, but every 10 levels you go up in rank. You start out as a lieutenant, um, and then at level 10 you become a lieutenant commander, and then at level 30 you become a captain, and at 40 you become an admiral, or like a low, no, what is it, um, low, lower half? Is, let's talk over here to the um, ship and shuttle requisitions here. Because it does say right here, yep. So you go from, oh, actually I'm on the Romulan side here, so the rank names are a little bit different. But um, you eventually do go up to a Vice Admiral, which is at level 60. So basically each 10 levels you go up in rank. Pretty simple, right? And for each of those levels, you can also equip higher and higher mark of gear. So up to level 10, you can equip mark 2, from level 10 to level 20, you can equip up to Mark 4, and then up to 30, Mark 6, and so on and so forth, where finally Mark 14 is the highest level, you know, that's level 60 gear. Now, 
Mark 14 is actually a little bit different because to get to Mark 14, you have to go through the upgrade system, which is very complex, and you don't need to worry about that as a low level player. But uh, basically, you know, every two Mark levels is, uh, or every 10 levels that you go up, every time you get a new rank, you can you equip a Mark level gear that's uh, two higher than what you had before. All right. So you will want to keep upgrading that, and you'll want to go back to those kit modules vendor and buy newer and newer kit modules. You can also buy them on the exchange, um, which I'm actually not sure how the market is on the console side. Probably uh, not. This you know is a very fresh new market, and because uh, it's separated from the PC side, I believe. So the market will be brand new. There might not be a huge selection of things there, but you can come over here to the market area and search for kit modules here um, like if you want photon grenade so you can come here and search for photon grenades and you can see it says you know these are mark 12 which basically means you have to be level 50 to use these and so on and so forth So like as every 10 levels, every time you go up in rank, you'll want to come back and try to upgrade your gear. I know your funding will be limited as a new level character, but it's something you want to do is to come back and periodically upgrade the mark level of your gear as you go up. All right, so those are some tips, you know, based on some things on the ground that I've seen people doing now. I would like to also give a few tips for uh, uh, the space side of combat. So let's go ahead and beam up into space. Now I am actually a level 60 character. Unfortunately, all my alts are actually level 60 and I don't have any character slots to make a new character. But I did go back to my trusty old Miranda. So you can see I'm here in my Miranda Cruiser, just like you probably are as a new player. And uh, mine might look a little bit different, but that's because you can get skins for your ship. Um, and believe it or not, what actually gives your uh, ship a different look or a skin is the shield. And later on when you get some high level shields and you equip them onto your ship, the visuals I'm using here are actually from the uh, counter command shield. Once you get some high level shields, you can equip them to your ship and it will actually change the cosmetics of your ship. Pretty cool, huh? But uh, so let's head out of uh, Earth Space Dock here and I'm going to head down to a patrol mission. And while we're on the way, I thought I would explain just how ship tiers work. Um, this is somewhat described in the tutorial and even some of the later missions. Um, some of the later uh, missions, basically each time you go up in rank, you are allowed to use a new tier of starship. And so, of course, you start out at Tier 1 here with your Miranda Cruiser. And as you go up every 10 levels, you can get a new one. And there's actually a very nice, each time you get a, uh, those 10 levels, you will get a new quest that will appear in your quest log to go talk to Admiral Quinn. And he will uh, promote you to the next rank, and they will tell you, you know, they'll lead you over to the shipyard where you can buy a new ship. And that basically happens every 10 levels. So I'm going to bring up the, the store here just real quick. You can kind of see this here as well. Um, so in tier one, you've got your uh, Miranda and you've got some actual ships you can purchase here from the store if you want. Um, these ships you go through very quickly, so it's not really that great of a purchase. But then you can go up to, you know, you have tier two, which is up through from levels, you know, 10 to 20, tier three up to level 30, tier four up to level 40, tier five up to 50. And then uh, tier six is the top level as the level cap is level 60. So you can use tier six ships starting from level 50 to level 60. These are your top end ships. So whenever you see like tier six ship, that is what you want to shoot for in the end game. But uh, pretty straightforward. All right, let's head down here now. Another thing that uh, I noticed people having issues with in their Let's Plays is, again, something that's not very well explained in the tutorial. And the tutorial does do some things well, you know, explains how to accelerate your ship, how to fire your weapons, and that kind of thing. One thing it doesn't explain very well is uh, firing arcs. Let's speed this up here. Is firing arcs. And I did notice some people were, you know, flying around and there's, you know, 
trying to uh, hit the enemy and they were wondering, you know, like, why aren't my torpedoes firing? Well, that's because uh, firing arcs. And when I go into a little patrol mission here, I will try to demonstrate that for several different weapon types to give you an idea how, how that uh, works. So let's patrol this, do this patrol mission here. All right, so, you know, you're on your little uh, Miranda ship, tier one ship here, and I believe the starting layout is something, just ignore the, uh, Ignore the little uh, gold border on the weapons here for now. Just pretend these are, this is just your standard beam weapon that you get. They give it to you right away. It's your standard phaser beam array. And this is your standard photon torpedo that you get right away. And I believe in the rear, they also give you a beam array. Now, each of these weapons has a different firing arc. And again, this is something they don't explain very well. But what you want to do is take advantage of that firing arc to, you know, try to use it to your advantage. But it also means that your ship will have to turn to make sure the enemy is within that firing arc, which makes your, you know, your ship's turn rate and maneuverability very important in this game. It is actually critically important because you have, you know, there's lots of ships that are designed to be fast and agile and are very good at with having a lot of forward firepower with narrow firing arc weapons. And then you've got your, like your cruisers that are really slow. And those are more designed to use like wide firing arc weapons. And, and going for like big broadside type attacks. Now, so again, here I am in this Miranda. <clears throat> and there's something you can do, and I actually not sure how you do this in console on the user interface, but if I mouse over this weapon here in my weapons, and you see how it has that little blue border around my ship. Let me zoom out here, you see a little better. And that little pop-up window is like covering the whole thing, so you can't see it very well. But you know, let's do it. See if I can do a top-down here. Now, if I again mouse over that weapon, you can kind of see that blue area. That blue highlighted area is the arc of that weapon, and you can see it. Even, it says it on the weapon itself, like in the tooltip. You can see there. This is a beam array, and beam arrays have a 250-degree firing arc. That is very, very good. So if you actually see, these are the my forward beam array and my aft beam array. Uh, you can see it has a 250 degree arc, but facing backwards. Now, if you actually think about it, since, since they have a 250 degree arc, if you there is a arc to the side of your ship where they overlap. And in fact, if you are broadside to your enemy, you, both your forward and aft beam arrays can fire on the enemy. So I'm going to start heading towards this group of enemies, and I will try to demonstrate that for you. Actually, before I get into range, let's just do one more thing here. Now, that is how the beam array firing arc works. Now, they also do start you out with a torpedo. And a photon torpedoes, for the most part, all of your tor torpedoes have a 90 degree forward firing arc. Or if you put them in your aft slot, they will have a 90 degree aft firing slot, uh, firing arc. So that's why I, a lot of people uh, that I noticed in their Let's Plays... Um, you know, they were facing broadside to the enemy and wondering why their torpedoes weren't firing, and that's because of the firing arc. Your torpedoes can only fire within a 90 degree arc, you know, forward of your ship. That's very common for all the different torpedo types, that 90 degree arc. And for all your different types of uh, beam arrays, they have that uh, 250 degree arc, which is very good. All right, so let's go ahead and go in here. So, so there's a few things you can see here as I'm firing on this. I'm keeping my broadside to him, and you can see both my aft and my forward phasers are firing on him, which is very good. And in fact, in this game, energy weapons, like your beam arrays, are very good at getting through the enemy's shields. Once enemy shields are down, then you can you know turn towards your enemy, get them into the arc of your torpedo, and then get off a nice torpedo shot on them. Torpedoes in this game, in general, are more effective against the enemy hull. So basically you want to use your energy weapons to take down their shields, get an exposed arc, and then that should hurt them real bad. Yep, there you go. Nice big hit on his hull. So use your energy weapons to take down that enemy's shield facing, and then use your torpedoes to hit the hull really hard. 
And that's, that strategy works quite well through most of the game. When you get into the late game, um, that changes a bit because eventually you get to the point where you will be able to buff up your you know, energy weapons so much that uh, they will actually start to outscale uh, torpedoes. Or vice versa, if you start to focus on torpedoes and kinetic damage, you will start to, you know, outdamage your energy weapons. So, that is more of a late game concern. While you're leveling up, it's, uh, it's generally pretty good since the base damage on torpedoes are so high. And before you have a lot of skills invested, just turn towards them, get a torpedo, and... Oh, see? Now... Since he had that shield facing was still up a little bit, the torpedo does a lot less damage. So try to take the shield facing down completely before you uh, fire off the torpedo. But yeah, as I was saying, generally in leveling, having torpedoes and energy weapons together is generally fine. Because the base damages are high, and on sh before you get to the late game where you have a lot of buffs for a particular type of weapon, you know, particularly for energy weapons versus torpedoes... Um, you know, until you get to that point, you're fine uh, having a mix of weapons. Usually you have, like, usually you fill out all of your weapon slots with energy weapons and then have, like, one torpedo just for those big hits on the hull once their shields are down. So those are kind of the basics of the arc. Now let me, um, let's finish this guy off here. Uh -huh. See, this torpedo does way more damage when it can get a nice uh, square hit on the hull without any shields. So yeah, that's something, you know, just some simple tactics to use while you're leveling up. All right, so before we head over to this next group of enemies, let me show you a few more things about firing arcs. Now, there are a bunch of different types of weapons in this game. So you saw the firing arcs for beam arrays and for torpedoes. Now there is something else. Uh, there's another type of array uh, beams in this game. These are called dual beam banks. Let's go ahead and put this on here. Now, when I mouse over this one, you'll see it has a much more narrow firing arc. Again, this go goes down to 90 degrees, but you can also see the damage is quite a bit higher. So, um, this is something you can consider getting as you're leveling up. You can invest into dual beam banks instead of the beam arrays if you want a forward firing ship. So, for, if your ship is maneuverable and you can always face the enemy, then you could go with dual beam banks instead of beam arrays. But if you're in a cruiser, with a slow turn rate, I definitely recommend sticking with the beam rays. They are still actually they're still actually pretty good, especially because you can broadside and have both your aft and fore weapons all firing at the same time. So that is a dual beam bank. There are also another type of energy weapon called cannons. Um, usually only certain ships can fit cannons. Typically your escort type ships, tactical base ships, are more geared towards cannons. But these have actually a very narrow firing arc. Um, so I just equipped a dual heavy cannon. And you can see here, this is actually only a 45 degree arc. Um, very, very narrow. But they do do actually very good damage. So, um, so yeah, that's something to keep in mind. There are also another type of cannon here called just dual cannons without the heavy. They do a little bit less damage. But they have a... It's kind of hard to explain. They do a little bit less damage. They have the same arc. But they actually have a different firing cycle. Which actually helps them to do a little more more damage over time. Whereas heavy cannons are more of a burst damage type weapon. You also have your single cannons. Which have a 180 degree arc. Um, not a very popular weapon. Um, if you're going for a wide arc, arc weapon. Most people tend to prefer the beams. But there is one nice thing that is another type of cannon called a turret. And these have a full 360 degree arc. These are really good for putting into your aft slot. Um, because since they are 360 degree, even in their aft slot, they will fire forward, which is pretty cool. So you can see with the setup I just created here, I have uh, dual heavy cannons up front along with my torpedo and then I have a turret in the rear so now my rear weapon and my cannons when I'm facing towards the enemy they will all be firing on that enemy again since the 
Tor uh, the turrets are 360 degrees. They, of course, do much less damage. Kind of the the more arc, the less the damage. The narrower ar the arc, the more the damage. That's pretty much how weapons are balanced in this game. So let's go in here and uh, do another set of enemies here and take these out with, ex with using the uh, cannons. my attack pattern alpha here, beef up my damage a little bit. Now since I am using cannons, you're going to want to stay facing towards the enemy. So you will want to be more, a little bit more maneuverable and want to reverse. Uh, Miranda is not a very maneuverable ship, unfortunately. So I am, it's not really a good cannon ship. But, uh, but there you go. Those are cannons that you can use. These are very popular on things like Birds of Prey, or things that have a lot of, you know, they're very maneuverable and have uh, like escort type ships, and in any faction, honestly, any kind of escort type ship does very good with uh, cannons. You can see my turret is kind of shooting those little pea shooter shots, those are the turret shooting away even though I'm facing towards them. That's the nice thing about turrets is that they do have that 360 degree arc. Now there is something called an omnidirectional beam. I guess I'll show that to you in a minute, but uh, the omnidirectional beams, they're something you get much later in the game. You don't really get them much while leveling, but those are beam weapons, kind of like your beam arrays that uh, do eventually, um, you know, they do have a 360 degree arc. They do a little bit less than the normal beam arrays. But uh, they are 360 degrees, which is nice, so you can put them in the rear and use them for certain builds. You will. Uh... And there we go. Alright, so there is one more group of enemies over there. Now for this one, I do want to show you a couple abilities. So let me put back on my... This time I'll go with a the dual beam banks that I mentioned. And in the rear, I'm going to put an omnidirectional. Um, omnidirectional beam bank. And what I want to show here is the ability of beam fire at will. This is something if you are going to use beam weapons on your ship, this is an ability that you will want to get very closely familiar with. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate it here. You saw Lummy take me kill his other enemies? Let's do this. See how my beams are actually hitting all three of them? It's because beam fire at will is a fantastic ability. It makes your beams hit all enemies you know, in their arc. And since beams typically have a very wide arc, it is actually a very good ability. Not only does it actually increase, you know, have your beams hit all web enemies in your arc, up to five, I believe, is the max targets. But uh, it actually increases the firing cycle, so you actually get five shots instead of four. There's all kinds of good things about being fire at will. It's a fantastic ability. I highly recommend it for new players. Um, and you can see I took out those three enemies much faster just by using that beam fire at will and some of my other abilities here. It's very, very good. There is another, um, there's a similar cannon ability called cannon scatter volley. That's also very good. It will help your cannons hit a, a group of enemies up to three. Very good ability. And torpedoes also have torpedo spread. Again, very good. It will make your torpedo spread out and hit everything in the arc, which is another very good ability. So keep those three abilities in mind. You'll want to train those to your bridge officers um, while you're leveling up. It will help out. Okay, so I did mention this earlier, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here because uh, it is can get very uh, convoluted. But um, and that is the difference between um, different types of weapons. Now, like I said, typically your energy weapons, you know, you have energy weapons which are good at taking out the shields, and uh, your torpedoes which are good at taking out the uh, hull of ships. 
And that's because they are actually different energy types. Wow, that really hurt. I'm going to adapt the weights and abilities here before I die. Um. So, yeah, as I was saying, there are, um, you know, different types of weapons for different situations. And how that is, uh, figured is their actual, like, the actual type of weapon that is, the actual damage type. There are lots and lots of different damage types. I'm not going to go into all of them. But just, they kind of fall into three general categories. You've got your energy weapons, which is your beams and your cannons. And energy weapons are, you know, pretty good against, they're, they do normal damage against shields and hull. All right. You can use them for both. Um, and they, you know, there's different types of energy weapons. You've got your beams, you've got your cannons, you've got, you know, different energy weapons. Uh, types as well, like the, um, you know, like plasma weapons versus anti-proton versus phasers. So there's a lot of complexity there, but just be aware that those are all categorized as energy weapons. Now, torpedoes are different. Those are categorized as um, kinetic weapons. It's actually a little bit odd to think about, but all of your torpedoes, even your plasma torpedoes, your photon torpedoes, they all do kinetic damage. And that is the damage that you want to use against the hull. And that's because uh, kinetic damage has a high damage reduction or against shields. So if you know if your torpedo hits the enemy shields, a lot of the damage is going to be negated. So you'll want to, you know, you want to use your energy weapons to get their shields down, and then fire your torpedo on the hull to get uh, that huge damage right on the hull without any uh, reduction. There is also a third type called exotic damage. Again, that's not something you need to worry about too much until way later in the game. But basically, exotic damage is kind of a catch-all category for everything that does damage that isn't a weapon. So like science abilities, there are some science abilities that do damage to the enemy. And those count as exotic. They don't count as energy, and they don't count as kinetic. That's, again, a very, very rough, uh, you know, uh, description of the different damage types that... I could make a whole hour video just on damage types, so I don't want to go into too much detail there. Just be aware that, you know, you want to use kinetic weapons like torpedoes against the hull, and you want to use your energy weapons against the shields, and as the hull as well. Um, they will do damage to the hull as well, but it's just that torpedoes have such a high base damage that they will hit very hard when they get that nice clean hull shot. And leveling up, you know, when you don't have a lot of buffs, you don't have a lot of tactical consoles beefing up your energy damage those torpedoes do hit nice and hard and they help you uh, kill enemies faster so all right so another little thing just a little nuance here that um i one let's player asked about that i wasn't quite sure but when i'm actually when i'm hitting the enemies here you'll see there's actually two damage numbers going up there's the blue damage and there's the yellow damage what that actually is is the blue damage is the damage hitting the shields and then the um, the yellow damage is the damage hitting the hull. And when you get a nice torpedo hit and you see that big crit go up and it's all yellow, that's because you probably got a nice big crit right on the hull. So that's just, you know, see now I'm hitting the shields facings down, all the damage numbers are yellow. Something to keep in mind there. Just you, That's how you know if you're hitting the shield or the hull. Now, you will actually see, you know, when I was hitting the enemies here, you see it's you, know, you see blue numbers and yellow numbers. You know, what does that mean? Why is why is some damage hitting the shields and some hitting the hull? And that's because of something, it's because I actually actually have some penetration on this character, but it's also because of something called bleed through. Um, in this game, your shields don't actually protect against 100% of damage, right? When you're taking damage, some of the, even if your shields are up, some of that damage will be going through to your hull. Like here, you can see on my ship, when I'm getting hit, you can see the shield damage on, you know, the, is in blue and the hull damage is in red. Now you can see the shields do absorb, absorb most of the damage. I believe on most of your standard type shields, your bleed through is, I think, 10% of the damage will get through to your hull. So, yeah, so about 10% will go through if you... There's different types of shields, like, for example, I'm using a what's called a resilient 
shield, I believe. Yes. And this only has a 5% bleed through, which is nice. A lot of people do like the resilient shields for that lower bleed through. Um, but they also have a lower capacity. I mean, the shield itself will absorb less damage, so it's kind of a trade-off. There are shields like the Covariant shields out there, which have a very high um, high capacity, but they also have the 10% bleed-through. So it's kind of a balance there. Um, but typically, people like the lower bleed-through of the Resilient shields. So that's, yeah, something to keep in mind. Take a look, you know, you'll know when you're... When you're damaging an enemy, if you don't see those blue damage numbers coming up anymore, that is because you, you know, you've penetrated their shields and now you're on to the hull, and that's you know the good time to start launching your torpedoes. All right. So that's some very basic things. Now, one other thing, I did see a few people uh, being a little bit confused about uh, the full impulse and how that works, and. Another thing they were also confused about was energy systems, and I will try to describe those very quickly. Again, those are very complex topics in general, but I'll just try to give, you know, touch the high points there, just so people know how to set their energy levels and how full impulse works. So, you see here, I'm actually, now, when I, you know, when you move your throttle up, and this is on the D-pad if you're on the uh, consoles, when you throttle up, you can actually, you know, throttle up to your uh, maximum throttle. So you can be at 100% throttle, but that's not really full impulse. You're at full throttle, but um, this is you know just about as fast as your ship can go while in combat. Now, when you're out of combat, you can actually go to full impulse, and uh, I believe if you press up on the D-pad again, it will toggle it if you're at full throttle, or on the PC, you can just click the uh, full impulse button. That will make your ship go much, much faster, all right? You can actually throttle down while you're in full impulse, and you will go a little bit slower, all right? So you can control your throttle in full impulse, and then when full impulse is off, you can also control your throttle. That's kind of how fast your ship can go while in combat, all right? Not too, not too complicated, but again, the tutorial kind of just kind of brushes up on that. It doesn't, uh, there's kind of two modes there, right? When you're not in full impulse, you have your, you know, you can throttle up and down, and then when you're in full impulse, you can f throttle up and down. Usually your full impulse is, you know, when you're out of combat and you want to get to the next area, you always go to full impulse, you want to get there quick. Now, um, there is a downside to full impulse. Now you can see in, while I'm in full impulse, all of my power systems have gone down. You can see this one's now, my weapons are at 5, um, shields are now at 5, your engines do go up to 100, but and then my aux power is down to 5. Now... That is basically the downside of full, full impulse. There is ways to mitigate that later. You can um, there's some skills you can get that will make you not lose or make you recover energy quickly, click more quickly when you drop out of full impulse. But that's kind of the downside. That's why you can't you don't want to you know right when you get into combat you're going to drop out of full impulse and you're going to have to wait for your energy systems to go back up. See how they're going back up now that I dropped out of full impulse. There's kind of that lag. And that's the downside of going to full impulse because it will drain the uh, energy from all of your subsystems. So speaking of energy into subsystems, again, it's a very complicated topic, but just very briefly, again, this is something the tutorial does not really um, explain very well and it's something you really should know. And that's, you know, each of these systems and what they do. So you have your weapons power as this first one here. Um, and this goes, you know, it goes up to a cap. You can set it up to 100 as the max. Um, that's the max you can set it to. You can actually get it over 100 once you get some um, bonus power to that system. And uh, there's there's ways to get it higher than 100, but basically you can set it up to 100. And what this does is it will increase the damage of your weapons. Pretty straightforward, right? In particular, we increase the the damage of your energy weapons, right? Not your kinetic weapons, not your torpedoes. That's not affected by your weapon power. And basically I recommend, I'm just going to flat out say, I recommend setting your weapon power to 100. You can actually, uh, you can see there are actually presets here. I believe this is on the console as well. There's a preset here called attack. I recommend you just click on that. That will set your weapons power to 100. It will lower your engine and aux power a bit but 
this will really, really help. I mean, it massively increases the damage of your weapons by a very, very significant amount. I believe going from a setting of 50 to 100 actually increases your weapon damage by basically double, 100% damage. So, and you can actually see the amount increases your weapon when you mouse over it, so you can actually see your weapon damage go up. And that's, again, your energy weapons. This increases your damage by so much, I think, it, you know, it is actually important to set cap this out at 100. It makes a huge difference in how fast you will kill the enemies, and uh, it'll make your leveling a lot quicker, even though it does, you know, make your ship a bit slower and your ox power a little bit lower. So that is weapon system power. Again, if you just click the attack preset, you should be golden for most of your leveling experience. Once you want to delve into it deeper, you may want to adjust. Like when you start getting into it, like science builds or torpedo builds, you might not necessarily need to run uh, full weapon power. All right. Shield power, again, it's um, pretty self-explanatory, but it does increase your um, re shield regeneration and also more importantly, your shield uh, uh, resistances. So it does make a bit of a difference. Um, don't worry too much if you drop it down a little bit, uh, but it, it does make a difference in your shielding and how much damage it can absorb and how fast they regen. The regen's not a huge deal. Your uh, power to your engine system, that you, again, um, it does make a big difference. It does affect your turn rate of your ship and your speed. So how fast your ship can maneuver in combat and how fast it can turn. Now, in general, the NPCs you fight in this game, they move pretty slow, right? So you don't need to be super fast uh, to chase down the enemies, with a few exceptions. Um, so having a low engine power again for just your normal leveling content is not a not a huge disadvantage. So you can again drop your uh, engine power down a little bit. Again, it does also slow down your turn rate, which is kind of a bummer, but um, again, it's not too too bad. And then finally, your aux power. Your aux power affects um, several abilities, in particular science abilities, but also like. Any kind of hull healing ability or shield healing ability will be modified by your aux power. Um, higher your aux power, the more your shield heals will do, the more your hull heals will do. Um, and also, if you have, if you're running damaging science abilities like gravity well and so on, they will do more damage if you have a higher aux power. So again, that's something you can drop down a little bit and not worry about too much, unless you're running like a science heavy build in the late game. You'll want to have a high aux power. Um, and there are actually some traits out there that scale your weapon damage off your aux power as well. So eventually you're going to want to have high... I mean, eventually once you get into endgame, you're going to want high of all of your power systems. And, you know, once you get some items and skills in the later game, you'll be able to do that without too much of a problem. You'll be able to have high in every single one of these. All right. So those are your power systems. Again, something not very well explained in the tutorial. If you just want to keep it simple, just hit this attack preset and you're golden. That's if that's the you know long and short of it. If you just want quick and easy, you don't want to uh, fuss around with it too much. Just hit the attack preset and go on your merry way. Let's go ahead and pick up these Verderon particles while we're here. All right. So that covers most of what I wanted to show in space combat. Just some basic tips, things that I saw people struggling with in their Let's Plays. I think that's just, it's very common things that uh, are easy to overlook because they're not described very well. You know, this is a very complex game and the tutorial just does not do a great job in explaining a lot of the in-depth in systems in this game. Um, and a lot of these systems, once you get into the late game, they interact in very interesting ways and there are lots of different builds you can make to to customize your ship and your play style to exactly how you want. There's torpedo builds, there's beam builds, cannon builds, science, exotic damage builds, there's everything. And uh, that's one of the great things about this game. And you you can worry about that later as you get more and more into the game. You can learn as you go. Uh, but hopefully these tips will just be good enough to get you started. So before I close out, I do want to describe one thing, which again is not something that's explained very well in the tutorials. And um, it's not doesn't have anything to do with combat, so I think we're done with the combat tips for now for ground and space combat. 
Now, when you're actually leveling up, you want to keep... Um, you want to understand the different kinds of currencies. Again, there's actually a lot of different kinds of currencies in this game, especially in the later game once you get into reputations and you get the reputation marks and all that stuff. But just again, to keep it simple for new players here, when you're going into the game, you just want to be concerned with the three main types of currencies. Now, the first one is energy credits. The second one is dilithium. And the third one is zen. And zen is your real money currency. All right. So let's talk about these here. Energy credits. These are the things that you, uh, this is kind of your typical in-game currency. This is right, you earn this by killing things, by selling things to vendors. This is like your gold in World of Warcraft. This is like your um, you know, silver in Black Desert and so on and so forth. That's your energy credits. You can buy things off the auction house with energy credits. The auction house is all in energy credits. Other players will sell things to you and you can sell things to them for energy credits. And uh, that's how that goes. Now, so that's kind of your basic type of currency, right? Now, there's your other type of currency, which is your real money currency, and that is Zen. Now, Zen is, you know, that's your real money currency. You can only get this with real money. You can't get it in game, in game with a little bit of a caveat there, which I'll get to in a second. You can't get this into game in the game at all. So this is your real money currency. So you can see how much Zen you have down here. And you can, this is what you use to buy things off of the Zen store or the Cryptic store. And this is where you go to buy, you know, ships, to buy um, duty officer packs. This is where you go to buy all of your character slots. This is where you can buy inventory slots. You can buy costume pieces, all of that good stuff, right? You buy that all from the Zen store using Zen currency. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute. Look at all these tier six ships in here. This is, you know, you can buy these all with Zen, with the real money. That's, you know, that's pay to win. You're getting like the top of line ships here. You can buy them right out with Zen. And honestly, I'd almost agree with you there. Um, buying top of the line ships with all the crazy good consoles and traits on them, you know, that's pay to win. Well, it would be, it would be pay to win except for one little thing. And that's the other currency here called dilithium. Now, dilithium is another currency that you can get in-game. In fact, you probably even have some dilithium, believe it or not. Because even now, as you're leveling up, you're just going through your normal missions here, your storyline missions, you will actually be getting dilithium. Because this is something that... Um, it's been in the game for a while now. Originally, back in the old days, you didn't get dilithium for missions. But since then, the, you do get actually get dilithium every time you complete a mission. And if you've gone through several missions you've been leveling up, you probably actually have a little stockpile starting to, sh to, to accumulate. And so the dilithium you actually get in the game comes in as ore, right? So the dilithium you get in the game is comes in as ore, and you need to refine that into refined dilithium. And that refined dilithium is what you can actually use to buy certain things. Now... Like I was saying before, one of the things you can actually buy with dilithium is Zen. You can actually, if you click on this exchange right here, you can actually convert Zen, uh, dilithium into Zen. You can actually, so other players can buy Zen and then they can sell it for dilithium. This is kind of your basic currency exchange. Pretty similar, what I would compare it to in like Blade and Soul would be like Hong Moon coins. So your dilithium is kind of like Hong Moon coins, although. I would say dilithium is much easier to get in uh, Star Trek than Hong Moon coins are in uh, in uh, Blade and Soul, but that's neither here nor, here nor there. This is just basically, this is the currency that you can get in-game and you can use that to buy the Zen, right? So that's why it's not quite pay to win, really. I mean, you can get enough dilithium, you can convert it to Zen, you can go into the store and you can buy your really fancy tier six st starship with Zen. So that's what kind of keeps it from being pay to win. It just means that you'll have to grind a lot of dilithium in game to, in order to do that. So I guess it's pretty typical of most of your free to play MMOs, right? You're basically pay, you can pay to buy the Zen and bypass the time that it would take to farm it, you, you know, through dilithium. So it's basically your, your pain to avoid the grind, which is pretty typical. I mean, it's even like Warframe, you can, um, you know, you can actually, uh, you can grind in game and buy, you know, and get 
mods and actually sell them for plat. In this, you can grind and game for dilithium and use that to buy Zen to get the good items that you want off of the store. So there, the only caveat here is you, there is a limit. You can only refine, you can get as much ore as you want of dilithium, but you can only refine 8,000 per, per day, all right? And that is per character. So if you have alts, you could earn 8,000 ore per day on each of the alts and then convert it to dilithium, uh, to refined dilithium, that is. So that is how dilithium works. So it's... You don't want to convert all of your dilithium to Zen because there are actually things in the game that use dilithium. Like later on in the game, when you get into reputation projects, they use dilithium. Um, when you buy, want to buy things off the dilithium store, when you buy things from the fleet store, they often cost dilithium. So you do want to hang on to some dilithium. But once you get to, uh, to a certain point in the game where you've got an overstock of dilithium, you know you can start then converting that to Zen and buying those fancy new tier six starships so so there you go those are the three currencies you got your energy credits which is your in-game currency you got your zen which is your uh real money currency and you got your dilithium which is kind of your in-between your go-between currency you can earn it in-game but you can convert it to real money currency but it is limited it's limited to that eight thousand per day which kind of keeps the value high so that's why it's it's more limited than like energy credits all right all right, so those are the basics, <clears throat> and um, hopefully you find that helpful. I do hope the console players out there are having a lot of fun with the game. It's always great to see some new, fresh players joining the game. Having a nice, healthy population is always important for any free-to-play MMO, and it's great to see, you know, it's great that the console release is out there. It's, um, it, it's uh, help bringing more players into the game is more income for Cryptic and Perfect World, and that is always a good thing. That means they will be supporting the game longer, and it uh, more content will be added to the game, and all of that good stuff. So, anyway, I hope you console players out this out uh, console players out there found this uh, helpful. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I'll try to answer them down below in the comments. There are actually some regular comment commenters on my videos that are also very, very knowledgeable, and they um, often correct me on things, but uh, they will also be, I'm sure, uh, happy to answer your questions as well. And in fact, let me also reference the uh, Star Trek Online Reddit. So if you go to the Stowe Reddit, um, it's just a very, very good community on there. You could also get your questions answered there. They are fantastic. I'm sure they are very welcoming to the new console players and we'll be happy to help answer some questions on the uh, Stowe Reddit. All right. But anyway, console players, we are happy to have you on board. I hope you enjoy the game. And uh, yeah, that's great. Um, I think that pretty much covers it for this video. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. And uh, that's all. Bye for now.